In this presentation, we look at another way to reduce consumption of gasoline and diesel fuel, and this is through the use of biofuels. Biofuels are replacement fuels for gasoline and diesel fuel. We look at three biofuels which are either currently replacing gasoline and diesel fuel or have the potential to do so in the future. They are ethanol, butanol, and diesel, biodiesel. So all of these are bio, and we'll show you in the next uh, slide what we mean by bio. Biofuels are renewable because they're derived from plant products. So once the biofuels have been consumed, New plants can be grown, and therefore new biofuels can be extracted from those plant products. They're also carbon neutral, as illustrated in this diagram. We see a plant that is used to produce a biofuel. The biofuel is consumed, which involves combustion and the release of CO2. But CO2 is then taken up by the plant during its growth stage. So there's no net CO2 released. This assumes, of course, that in the processing of the plant material, there is no fossil fuel used. And we'll see a little bit further on whether this is in fact the case. Now gasoline, the main transportation fuel, is made of a various kinds of hydrocarbons. Uh, but the most typical kind of hydrocarbon you would find in gasoline is heptane. And here we're looking at a diagram of heptane. And we see, I'm counting, seven carbon uh, atoms within the molecule, and it looks like uh, 16 hydrogens. So it's a hydrocarbon, uh, a long, fairly long chain hydrocarbon. So this would be a typical gasoline uh, a component. Now, if we look at a first replacement for gasoline ethanol or bioethanol because it's derived from biological materials, ethanol looks a bit like heptane, looks a bit like a gasoline component because it's made of a hydrocarbon chain, not a particularly long one in this case, and it also has an OH at the end, it's an alcohol. So because it's an alcohol, it has a little different properties than you would get from a gasoline natural component. So when we use ethanol or bioethanol, we mix it with gasoline to make this potent cocktail of called gasohol. And this is E10, called ethanol 10 or E10, which means it's 10% ethanol and 90% gasoline. So that's what we, when we fill up our cars in Connecticut and most other places in the U.S., we're getting gasohol, so we're getting 90% gasoline and 10% ethanol. This is basically a good deal because at that level, uh, ethanol serves as an oxidizer and gives us better burning of gasoline and less carbon monoxide emissions. Now, to produce bioethanol, it's mostly produced in the U.S. from corn, there's a whole bunch of stages. And here we've kind of shown a, 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 a summary of those stages. There's grinding, there's turning, there's sacrification, there's fermentation, there's distillation, and there's uh, dehydration. Now, the big tricky step here is the stage where we take we go from starches, which is what's in corn. It's a starchy food, as you know. You're eating your starches when you eat corn, and you turn that starch into glucose, into sugar. That's a difficult step. It takes enzymes in, in, in your body or in nature. This may go quickly, but in an industrial process, we need particular enzymes to do it. That's the tricky part of the process. Now, corn is not the only source of bioethanol. And in fact, in Brazil, the major source of bioethanol is sugarcane. Sugarcane is great because it's not a starch. You take sugarcane, there's lots of sugar, so you don't have to go through the stage of making sugar. You can go to the fermentation stage right away. 
So this is easy, but we don't grow a lot of sugar cane in the U.S., so it's not really the approach that we've taken. The most ambitious thing to do is to use cellulose-rich plant material like switchgrass. Uh, this is way tougher because it involves enzymes to break down cellulose and to make sugars that can be used in the fermentation process. So what we mostly do in the U.S., therefore, is corn because it's the easiest thing we can do. Now, there's a little catch about using corn to make bioethanol. It is because the energy balance, which is shown here as the output energy divided by the input energy, the energy balance isn't very big. It's like 1.3. So we're only getting like 30% more energy out, which is the, the energy out means is the energy we get when we, uh, we combust bioethanol in our car engine. So it's only about 30% greater than the energy used to make bioethanol. A lot of that energy, by the way, is energy that comes from fossil fuels used in the process of making bioethanol. It's much easier, as I mentioned before, with sugarcane making, uh, getting bio, getting bioethanol from sugar, you get an energy balance of eight, much better than 1.3. Now here's an interesting and fairly complex slide to look at. It shows different ways of getting biofuel, bioethanol in, in particular, and the greenhouse gas reduction used by with that biofuel. And it shows that if you use typical corn ethanol, you get a fairly small reduction, like 19%. But if you get that corn uh, bioethanol by using as the fossil fuel, instead of the fossil fuel, I should say, you use biomass, you're burning, you're burning other uh, biological material, then you can get a 50% reduction. However, if you use sugarcane, or cellulosic uh, ethanol, you can get an even greater reduction. So the real goal at some point, we should be getting most of our bioethanol from cellulosic sources. Uh, but the truth is right now, for a variety of reasons, one is we don't really have the science of cellulosic ethanol worked out very well. And we got a lot of corn in the United States and we have corn farmers who like the profit they make uh, from growing corn to make ethanol. So for those reasons, we uh, make most of our bioethanol by using corn as our source. As we showed in the last two slides, this is not the most efficient way to do things, but it's the way we're doing things right now. It's not a huge, uh, a, not a huge uh, uh, energy balance, but it is a positive energy balance at least. Now we've talked about gasohol, which is the E10 or 10% mixture of bioethanol and gasoline, but it's possible to mix ethanol in stronger, more potent mixtures. And E85, where you have 80% ethanol and therefore 15% gasoline is one possibility. We don't use this very much because not all cars, all engines are capable of using E85, the stronger um, mixture. The reason for that is the alcohol uh, ha has properties that uh, is not compatible with some of the internal workings of the gasoline distributing system within the vehicle. But on the other hand, in the United States, there are millions of flex fuel vehicles. So those vehicles in the U.S. can actually use safely E85. So if you're wondering whether you could, in your vehicle, use E85, which is 85% ethanol and 15% gasoline, it depends on whether your vehicle is a flex fuel vehicle. You can look online and find out which vehicles are, or if you... Uh, have a vehicle and you have a little thing on the side of it that says flex fuel. That's probably a pretty good indicator that it's a flex fuel vehicle. Now, if you visit Brazil or you live in Brazil, then there is the option of running your car on E25, 
or E100. So some cars in Brazil can run on 100% bioethanol. And the bioethanol, of course, in Brazil is derived from sugarcane. Brazil has the right kind of climate. They can actually have two sugarcane crops a year and produce a great deal of bioethanol. So this seems like a really excellent product. At one point, we were going to import it in the United States, but that would undermine our own bioethanol business, so we're not actually doing that. This is a uh, chemical structure formula for butanol. As you can see, this is more like heptane. It's more like gasoline. It's still an alcohol, but it's still more like uh, heptane than is ethanol. So this would be a better substitute for gasoline than ethanol. So in fact, biobutanol is what we would call a drop-in fuel. That is, you could take the gasoline out of your tank and drop in biobutanol, and it would work just like gasoline. So we could run cars on 100% biobutanol uh, with no modification of the vehicle. So it's kind of a better answer to the uh, gasoline replacement story than is ethanol. Uh, and uh, we can make it basically similar, pretty much the same process as we use to make ethanol. We just have to gear up factories to do that. And the question is, will we do that in the near future? There's good reasons to do it, but it would take some capitalization to get there from here. The third type of biofuel is biodiesel. This is not a replacement for gasoline, but a replacement for diesel. We see here how you can, the process that you can use to take a oil, a, uh, a plant oil, or even an animal oil, and to uh, mix it with methanol to make biodiesel fuel. And biodiesel fuel is the thing I've circled in green on the right. Uh, this is a fatty ester, uh, and this actually is works very well, burns pretty well as a uh, as a diesel replacement. So it's this thing of circle, which is what is called a fatty ester. R stands for a side chain group that we don't have to specify. Now, if you have a diesel vehicle, basically all diesel vehicles could run B20, which is biodiesel 20 meaning it's a 20% mixture of biodiesel and conventional petroleum-derived diesel fuel. Now, some vehicles can be modified to run stronger mixtures, say a B100, but most vehicles, or almost all diesel vehicles, can run the B20. So this is a fuel that, with some people, is, is a popular fuel because it's a green, it's a green biological fuel. I have to mention also you can use uh, biodiesel as because diesel fuel basically is uh, number two heating oil can be used as a heating oil. Biodiesel has some advantages. Certainly, it's not a petroleum derived product, so we don't have to go through all the things that we have to do to uh, to extract uh, oil from the ground and so forth. And also, we, we there's no net CO two emissions under uh, ideal conditions, uh, but also the, 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 the quality of the emissions is better. Uh, we can see that the particulate matter, carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons are quite a bit less uh, with biodiesel. The only kind of fly in the ointment, the only problem is the nitrogen oxide content goes up a little bit. So there's a little trade-off here, but uh, basically biodiesel is a more benign fuel than a gasoline drive diesel. So the bottom line of these comparisons is comes here basically. Remember we use about 134 billion gallons of gasoline a year. Uh, right now uh, bioethanol is uh, at the 10 percent level because we're mixing 10 percent uh, bioethanol with gasoline. Uh, highway diesel is about 60 billion gallons of gasoline, of, of I should say diesel, a year, and biodiesel is only one sixtieth of this. 
So biodiesel is not as anywhere near a big a com of a commercial product as bioethanol. Bioethanol is uh, pretty major that we're looking at 13 billion gallons. And so that's a lot of money and a lot of um, uh, a lot of replacement of uh, gasoline. A complexity in this whole process is that there is a U.S. law that requires the EPA to enforce minimum biofuel consumption mandates. So there is a need for a certain amount of, according to this law, of bioethanol to be consumed each year. A little problem has come up recently in the fact that we're not using as much gasoline because of better vehicles with uh, higher fuel uh, e economy and also because of the recession and therefore there's kind of surplus bioethanol and there is a therefore uh, a some pressure on uh, EPA to reduce the mandate for bioethanol consumption so these are kind of uh, politically complex and also regulatorily complex the other complex issue is that uh, since we're deriving almost all of our biofuels from corn, corn is a food uh, and for people and for cattle, and cattle is a, f is a food for people. And therefore, when we're taking corn to make fuel, we're making uh, f corn for food more scarce and therefore the price of corn and beef goes up. Uh, this is particularly critical right now when we're in the middle of a serious drought where there's less corn being grown. So there are some difficult political and regulatory complexities about the bioethanol business uh, that we uh, will look at in the course.